the lost civilization of outdoor living. It was the Etruscans who truly mastered the art of blending architecture with the natural world. As we walk through the ruins of their cities today, we're stepping into a world where outdoor living wasn't a design trend. It was essential to how they understood life. The Etruscans, who lived in what is now Tuscany from the 8th to 3rd centuries BCE, created spaces where nature wasn't separate from daily life. Their homes and public spaces embraced the outdoors, integrating courtyards, gardens and verandas in a way that feels surprisingly modern. But who were these people? The Etruscan civilization, which flourished from the 8th century BCE until its gradual absorption by Rome in the 3rd century BCE, stands out for its innovative contributions to architecture, urban planning and outdoor living. Their mastery in creating harmonious environments that blended nature with daily life set them apart from their contemporaries. From the expansive courtyards and open-air atriums in their homes to their highly organized cities that integrated agriculture and green spaces, the Etruscans established a model of living that would influence the Mediterranean world for centuries. Their practices didn't just shape landscapes, they defined a way of life that still resonates in the Tuscan architecture we admire today. The Etruscans have long been overshadowed by their Roman successors, yet their civilization was among the most advanced of their time, predating Rome by centuries and influencing it in ways most don't realize. By the time Rome was built, the Etruscans had already established advanced engineering, religious rituals and city planning. So why do so few people know about this enigmatic civilization? Let's dive into the heart of Etruscan society, their homes and cities, which were intricately tied to nature. Etruscan settlements were built on hilltops, designed to harmonize with the surrounding landscapes, often overlooking valleys and rivers. This strategic positioning not only offered protection but also connected them spiritually to the land. Their reverence for the natural world influenced everything, from their burial practices to the layout of their cities. The Etruscans believed that open spaces weren't just for aesthetic pleasure, they were vital for community living. This is where the concept of outdoor living was born. Courtyards were the centerpiece of their homes, with rooms facing inward, allowing residents to gather, socialize and connect with nature. These spaces also held religious significance. Shrines and altars in courtyards were common, reinforcing their connection between home, community and the divine. The Etruscan cities, particularly in Tuscany, were divided into sacred, public and private spaces, with open-air courtyards used not just for leisure but also for political and religious gatherings. Nature wasn't just a backdrop, it was a participant in daily life. If you walk through the Tuscan countryside today, you might think you're simply admiring modern Mediterranean architecture. But what you're really seeing is a living testament to Etruscan ingenuity. The Etruscans pioneered a philosophy of building that balanced human activity with nature and these elements continue to define Tuscan and Mediterranean architecture today. Their use of natural materials like stone, wood and terracotta was not just about availability but about creating harmony with the earth. These materials were left mostly untreated, allowing the homes to age naturally, blending into the landscapes. The idea of sustainability, which we prize so highly today, was ingrained in Etruscan building practices over 2,500 years ago. Their mastery of hydraulic engineering also cannot be understated. The Etruscans were among the first to create complex drainage systems, essential for both urban planning and agriculture. These innovations in water management allowed them to cultivate lush gardens and ensure that water flowed easily through their cities, a practice later adopted and expanded by the Romans. What most people don't know is that the Etruscans had a deep understanding of geology, which informed their choice of building materials. They specifically chose tuff, a volcanic stone, because of its durability and insulating properties. Even the Romans adopted this practice, using tuff to construct the Cloaca Maxima, Rome's first great sewer system. Their temples were particularly innovative. Unlike the Greeks, who focused on symmetry and proportion, Etruscan temples were characterized by their massive roofs that extended far beyond the walls, creating covered porches that blurred the line between interior and exterior. This architectural style, which emphasizes large, open spaces, has directly influenced the Tuscan villas we admire today with their sweeping terraces and broad overhangs designed to provide shade and shelter in outdoor living areas. No, the Etruscans didn't build Rome brick by brick, but their influence is woven into the very foundations of the city. Long before the Roman Republic emerged, Etruscan kings ruled Rome, shaping its early infrastructure and architectural identity. From drainage systems to temples, the early Romans adopted key Etruscan methods that would later define Roman grandeur. In fact, Rome's transformation from a small settlement to a burgeoning city-state owed much to the advanced urban planning and architectural expertise of the Etruscans. One of the most iconic symbols of Roman architecture, the arch, was actually an Etruscan invention. The Etruscans perfected the use of the arch in their own city walls and gateways, creating stable, impressive structures that would later inspire the Roman aqueducts and amphitheatres. Without this innovation, Roman engineering brilliance would not have reached the monumental heights we associate with structures like the Colosseum or the triumphal arches scattered throughout the empire, temples and religious architecture. The Etruscan influence wasn't just about infrastructure, it was deeply spiritual. Etruscan temples were architectural masterpieces and their design was directly imported into early Roman religious architecture. 
Podium temples, one of the key features the Romans borrowed was the use of raised stone podia. Etruscan temples were built on these platforms, elevating them both physically and symbolically above the surrounding landscape. The Temple of Jupiter, Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill was modeled after this Etruscan innovation. Wooden columns, while later Roman architecture is known for its marble and stone columns, early Roman temples featured wooden columns with stone bases, a direct Etruscan import known as Tuscan columns. These columns became a hallmark of both Etruscan and early Roman architectural style. Terracotta decorations, the Etruscans were known for their extravagant use of terracotta in temple decoration. Life-size statues of gods often adorned the rooftops, adding a dramatic flair. Early Roman temples embraced this ornate, colorful style before evolving into the more austere marble designs we associate with Roman architecture today. Domestic architecture, one of the most significant contributions of Etruscan design to Roman life was in domestic architecture. The atrium house, a staple of Roman residential life, can be traced back to Etruscan homes. Atrium houses. The Etruscans designed their homes around a central open courtyard which allowed air and light to circulate, creating a harmonious living environment. The Romans not only adopted this design but honoured its origins by calling it the Atrium Tuscanicum. This layout became essential in Roman homes, where the atrium often served as the heart of the household, city planning and infrastructure. The Etruscans were also pioneers in urban planning. Their cities such as Tarquinia and Volterra were fortified with massive stone walls featuring arched gateways. These early examples of monumental architecture paved the way for the triumphal arches and elaborate fortifications that would later become Roman trademarks. Arches and city walls. The Romans took Etruscan techniques and scaled them up, creating grander arches for triumphs and public celebrations, but it was the Etruscans who laid the groundwork with their practical yet impressive designs. Drainage systems. Another significant innovation was in urban infrastructure. Etruscan cities featured rock-cut drainage systems which were crucial in managing water and preventing floods in their urban centers. This knowledge directly influenced Roman engineers, who expanded on these systems to create the vast networks of aqueducts and sewers that sustained the growing Roman population. Tombs and funerary architecture, even in death, the Etruscans left an indelible mark on Roman culture. Etruscan tombs evolved from simple tumuli, earthen mounds, into elaborate rock-cut tombs designed to mimic the homes of the living. Tumuli and rock-cut tombs, these tombs, such as those found in the UNESCO sites of Cerveteri and Tarquinia, were designed as underground homes for the dead, complete with furnishings and elaborate frescoes depicting the afterlife. This style of tomb building influenced Roman funerary architecture, where the dead were often entombed in columbaria, multi-level structures that housed the remains of numerous individuals. The Etruscan approach to death, where tombs mirrored the architecture of daily life, resonated with the Romans, who embraced this concept of immortality through architecture. Their elaborate tombs became symbols of power, legacy, and the eternal connection between life and death. Etruscan kings ruled Rome in its formative years, and the cultural exchange between the two civilizations was profound. Rome inherited much of its religious practices, governance, and even its alphabet from the Etruscans, proving that before there was Roman culture, there was Etruscan culture. The Etruscan political system was a complex federation of city-states, each ruled by a king or lucumo. These leaders weren't just military generals, they were also religious and civic leaders who governed by the divine will. While most ancient civilizations centralized their power, the Etruscans ruled through a loose confederation, a stark contrast to the imperial expansionism of Rome. This system allowed each city to develop its character and we can still see the unique identity of Etruscan cities like Tarquinia, Volterra and Cerveteri in the remnants of their walls and tombs. Each city had its sacred sites with temples and altars designed to honor specific gods. The towns were well fortified and often built on elevated positions. The Etruscans believed that higher ground brought them closer to the gods. Today, our understanding of the Etruscans is being constantly rewritten thanks to ongoing archaeological discoveries. In Vetulonia, archaeologists have unearthed an extraordinary Etruscan villa, complete with intricate mosaics, courtyards and ornate fountains. This find offers a rare glimpse into the domestic life of the Etruscans, showing their commitment to beauty, function and harmony in living spaces. The UNESCO-recognized necropolises at Tarquinia and Cerveteri are another key to unlocking the mysteries of this lost civilization. These tombs are more than just burial sites. They are monuments to Etruscan culture, with elaborate frescoes and carvings that depict the daily life, religious beliefs and afterlife expectations of the Etruscans. These necropolises were constructed to mirror the layout of the living cities, complete with streets, houses and public spaces for the dead. The tombs themselves were often modelled after the homes of the deceased, with frescoes and carvings depicting scenes from daily life, including feasts, dances and religious rituals, emphasising that life in the afterward was a continuation of the joys and responsibilities of the earthly one. Walking through these tombs is like stepping into a time capsule, offering a direct window into their world. The Etruscans believed that death was a continuation of life, which is why their tombs were designed to resemble their homes. The design of these tombs, which sometimes included multiple chambers and were elaborately furnished with goods for the deceased, demonstrated the Etruscans' belief that the dead would need these items in their next life. 
This concept would heavily influence Roman funeral practices, but the scale and detail of Etruscan necropolises reflect a society deeply concerned with the journey of the soul and the need to honor the dead with the same care and grandeur they experienced in life. This conception is strikingly similar to the Egyptian concept of burial for the afterlife, showing just how connected ancient cultures could be, despite the distance between them. The Etruscans were a deeply spiritual people with a pantheon of gods and a belief in fate that was woven into the very fabric of their society. Many of the myths and legends are associated with later Romans. The Etruscan goddess Uni would become the Roman Juno, and the myth of Aeneas, who founded the Roman people, likely has Etruscan origins. Their mythological figures, like Tinia, the sky god and king of their pantheon, were central to their religious practices, and the art found in their tombs reflects a rich tradition of storytelling that still influences modern Italian folklore today. Before we wrap up, let's dive into some frequently asked questions about the Etruscans. Did the Etruscans really invent the gladiatorial games? The Etruscans did host combat as part of funeral rituals, but these weren't entertainment events. They were religious in nature, meant to honor the dead. The Romans later transformed this into the public spectacles we associate with gladiators. Why do we know so little about the Etruscan language and inscriptions? People often think that because the Etruscans lived in such close proximity to Rome and Greece, their language must be well understood much like Latin or Greek. The Etruscan language is one of the biggest mysteries in ancient Mediterranean studies. Unlike Latin or Greek, Etruscan belongs to a non-Indo-European language family, making it difficult to decipher using traditional linguistic methods. While we have thousands of inscriptions, most are short funerary or religious texts, which provide little grammatical or syntactical context. Additionally, the Etruscans did not develop an extensive body of literature like the Greeks or Romans, and much of what they wrote was on perishable materials such as linen and wax tablets which haven't survived the centuries. The Liber Linteus, a linen book that was repurposed as mummy wrappings in Egypt remains the longest Etruscan text we have today, but even it offers limited information. This linguistic isolation means that although their alphabet was derived from Greek, the meanings of most words are still uncertain. As a result, much of Etruscan culture remains enigmatic. What was the role of women in Etruscan society, and how did this affect their architecture? Many assume that, like in most ancient civilizations, women in Etruscan society had limited social roles. Etruscan women enjoyed a higher status and more freedom than their contemporaries in Greek and Roman societies. This cultural distinction is reflected in Etruscan art and architecture. Women appear prominently in funerary sculptures and frescoes, often depicted dining with men, participating in religious rituals or involved in public life, activities that were off-limits to women in most other ancient cultures. The equal prominence of men and women in Etruscan households may have influenced the design of homes as communal spaces, where women were not confined to private spheres. These societal norms also extended to the construction of tombs, where husbands and wives were often depicted side by side in tomb paintings. This equality likely influenced the design of public spaces and homes where the distinction between male and female areas was less rigid than in Roman or Greek architecture. Were the Etruscans influenced by Greek architecture or was it the other way around? Many believe that Greek architecture directly influenced the Etruscans due to Greece's historical prestige and dominance in the ancient world. While there was definitely cultural exchange between the Etruscans and the Greeks, especially through trade, it's a misconception that Etruscan architecture was simply derivative of Greek styles. In fact, Etruscan temples and public buildings predate much of Greek influence and possess features entirely unique to Etruscan society. Etruscan architecture heavily focused on wooden superstructures, terracotta decorations and deep columned porches, elements which are rarely seen in Greek architecture. The Etruscan temple layout differs greatly from the Greek models. While Greek temples were typically long and narrow, Etruscan temples were wide and shallow, emphasizing the front porch pronaos and relegating the cult statue to the back of the temple, a feature later adopted by the Romans. Why did Etruscan architecture incorporate so many terracotta decorations? Some people assume the Etruscans used terracotta simply because it was an affordable or easy material to work with. Terracotta was not just a practical material, but an artistic and symbolic medium. The Etruscans believed in using materials from the earth to reflect their connection to nature and the divine. Terracotta's flexibility allowed them to create life-sized sculptures and intricate architectural decorations that wouldn't have been possible with stone. For example, the Temple of Apollo at Vei featured terracotta statues on the roof. Most famously, the life-size statue of Apollo, which showcased the Etruscans' ability to create monumental, expressive figures with flowing drapery and dynamic poses. Terracotta's lightweight made it ideal for placing on the high roofs of temples, which was typical in Etruscan architecture, but not common in Greek or Roman temples. The Etruscans may be a lost civilization, but their influence is alive in the architecture, myths and daily life of Tuscany today. So what can we learn from their way of life? Is their balance with nature something we should bring back? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to Mythomaniac Legends Alive, where we unravel the mysteries of ancient civilizations and keep the stories of the past alive.